as you're able to do so as we turn to the first epistle of Peter. We stand out of reverence to God's Word. We stand as we pray because standing in prayer is a biblical posture of prayer, whereas nearly never do we see anybody sitting down while they're praying. And we stand now out of reverence to God's Word. This is His infallible, inspired Word. Let's give our careful attention to its reading in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation... The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. As we turn to our psalm of preparation, number 119U, in the book of Psalms for singing. Mm -hmm. 
joined together at the throne of God again to seek his blessing on the word as it's preached and as it's heard. Let's pray. Lord, incline our hearts toward your testimonies. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your holy word. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Send out the light and the truth of your Holy Spirit. Let him lead us and bring us to your holy dwelling places. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Over 18 centuries ago, a young philosophy scholar from the Roman colony near ancient Samaria was walking along the Mediterranean Sea. He had drawn out of many philosophical wells, including Stoicism, Aristotelianism, Pythagoreanism, and Platonism, only to be left thirsting for the truth. But on this walk by the sea, this young man named Justin Martyr met an elderly Christian man who engaged him in a conversation that changed the course of his life. This unknown believer showed him how philosophers, while philosophers reasoned about truth, the Hebrew prophets were receptacles of absolute truth, divine truth. He explained to him how the prophets had foretold the coming of Christ and how their predictions were fulfilled in his life and his work. And taking the elderly man's life, Justin Martyr began to study the prophets of the Old Testament scriptures. He began to study their fulfillment in the New Testament, in the Gospels and the other writings there. And having been convinced of the truth of Scripture, he put his faith in Jesus Christ and was converted. His works, first apology or first defense and second apology, show him to be one of the earliest and ablest defenders of the Christian faith. Years later, after this walk along the sea, in, one, in A.D. 165, Justin Martyr and some of his disciples were beheaded for holding to the truth that he had discovered in the scriptures and refusing to submit to emperor worship. By the time Justin Martyr gave his life for the truth, Peter's first epistle had been circulating for about a hundred years in the churches, being read in the churches, being expounded in the churches. And surely, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, which is our text today, must have resonated in his heart as a consequence of the study that he had done in the Old Testament prophets and their fulfillment in the New Testament writings. Peter's addressing this first epistle to those who had earlier suffered persecution in the church. Writing to those he calls pilgrims of the Jewish dispersion, the Jewish diaspora, aliens and strangers, in this world, he calls them, verse 1. But remember that as this letter, uh, given that this letter did circulate among the churches of that day, Peter's message extended the same hope to 
believers throughout the church who were suffering under the persecution of the Roman Empire at that time. In verses 1 and 2, Peter reminds them that their election is a Trinitarian election. He says to these believers in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, you're, you are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. Secondly, uh, in verses 3 through 5, he teaches them that the Christian's hope is a confident expectation. It's not a mere wish. It's not a mere desire. It's not a hope in the wind that something might happen, but the hope that he proclaims to them is a confident expectation secured by Christ's resurrection from the dead and sustained by the promise of an eternal heavenly inheritance. In verses 6 through 9, which we considered together last Lord's Day, he shows us that the Christian's hope is calculated to uphold him in the midst of life's greatest trials and tribulations. And the apostle's purpose in our text today, in verses 10 to 12, is to show believers that God's wondrous plan of salvation in Jesus Christ, revealed through the prophets and the apostles, swallows up this life's tribulation. We'll look at three things together today regarding God's plan of salvation through Christ. It was prophesied from ancient times. The apostle says in the first place, it was researched with great care. And thirdly, it was prophesied for your benefit. It was prophesied from ancient times, researched with great care, prophesied for your benefit. In the first place, God's plan of salvation through Christ was prophesied from ancient times. Now, who are these prophets and what was their message? That's what we want to discover under this first heading. Who are these prophets? Well, Peter has in mind all the prophets from Moses to Malachi which we just happened to read this morning. Remember how the risen Christ referred to the prophets in his conversation with two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, recorded in Luke 24, 26, 26 and 27, reminding them of what he had told them before his death, namely, that all things which are written about me, Jesus said, all things that are written about me in the law and in, uh, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Peter is referring to all the prophets from the time of Moses to the time of Malachi. And he said, all these things are fulfilled in me. Now, what was their message? Well, Peter says that the prophets, the prophets prophesied. And he means the Old Testament prophets prophesied with unanimity, with one voice, that is, of the grace that would come to you. That is, they prophesied about Jesus Christ and the grace that God would bring to his people through Jesus Christ. The prophets declared that God's, by God's gracious determination, and by his plan, a costly redemption of sinners would be carried out. That they would be released from the bondage of their sin and iniquity. And that it would be undertaken. That salvation would be carried out by the Messiah that they proclaimed. And among other things... Peter's words in the context of this first epistle in verses 10 through 12 confirm the essential unity of the Old and New Testaments. Because we're going to go on to see 
that these things that were prophesied were confirmed in what the, the apostles preached. And as they preached, as they proclaimed the grace that would come to you, so the new covenant apostles preached the grace that would come to you. An essential unity between Old and New Testaments, an essential unity between Old and New Covenants, which has a profound impact upon the way we do our theology. Namely, that we don't do our theology in a vacuum. The New Covenant, the New Testament, has its background in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. So we don't reason apart from an understanding of the fullness of the revelation of Jesus Christ, old and new. It has a profound impact on the church of Jesus Christ today. In its worship. In its government. In its discipline. In its sacraments. And that's the first thing, I think, practically, that we ought to take away from this text. That essential, uh, essential, essential unity between Old and New Testaments. God's wondrous plan of salvation through Christ was prophesied from ancient times. Secondly... God's plan of salvation through Christ was researched by the prophets with great care. Now, Peter tells us something about the method of the prophets' inquiry into the, the prophecies of the Old Testament scriptures. They weren't casual. They weren't careless in their reception or their declaration of the precious, precious message entrusted to them. Rather, verse 10, Peter tells us that they made careful search and inquiry into the message that they received from the Lord. They weren't innovators, but they were partners in a message revealed over centuries through God's inspired servants. And if they were uncertain about anything, about any aspect of the task that, that, that they did, they made painstaking research in order that they might be faithful in proclaiming God's word. And we find, for example, uh, we find an illustration of this in the prophet Daniel. Daniel, remember, was uh, carried away with the exiles to Babylon. And we find uh, in the context of Daniel's experience there, uh, uh, the circumstances of his life are recorded for us in Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. For the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So here's a prophet himself who's making careful inquiry into the prophecy of another prophet, Jeremiah. And understood from Jeremiah's prophecy that their captivity in Babylon their captivity under the Chaldean people would be 70 years. And he's coming to the end of those 70 years. And he begins to take courage in what God prophesied through Jeremiah. And it emboldens him as, as God's prophet. So they, they, they weren't careless. They, they weren't casual in, in the way they, they carried out their task. But at the same time, they weren't merely doing so by their own intellectual powers. That's what Peter tells us here in verse 11. They were seeking to know what the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. 
So the same Spirit who is at work in the New Testament apostles was at work in the Old Testament prophets, the same Spirit who is at work in us. And they, through the Spirit and His inspiration, made careful inquiry, seeking to know what the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. Peter emphasizes this point in his second epistle in the first chapter. Know this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. So that what we have in the Bible is not merely the word of man. God did use men to write the Bible. God did use their gifts. He used their intellects. He used their own stylistic habits in writing. But these men were moved by the Holy Spirit to pen the very words that they wrote, which means that these words are not man's words, they're God's words and absolute truth. Even as that elderly Christian along the Mediterranean Sea revealed to Justin Martyr. This is a receptacle of God's absolute truth. And that's one of the things that Peter is trying to impress upon his readers in that day. And it's, it's a point that ought to be impressed on you and me today as we, as we read these words. And Peter also tells us something about the subject of their inquiry. They made inquiry into the person, into the person of Christ, the person of Christ that the Spirit of Christ was revealing to them. They sought to know the person that the Spirit was indicating. Verse 11, they knew and consistently pointed to the truth that God would bring salvation through a Messiah. And that truth is proclaimed throughout the Old Testament scriptures, but it's nowhere more clearly proclaimed than in the prophet Isaiah. For example, uh, in chapter 9 and verses 6 through 7, this is one of the, one of the, uh, one of the passages in, in the Old Testament scriptures that is so, uh, is so, so much at the forefront of our minds during the season of Christmas. It's a wonderful prophecy. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures, prophesied concerning the person and the work of Jesus Christ. They prophesied with regard to the timing of Christ's coming. They were seeking to know, verse 11, what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. Now, it's interesting that today the church seems to be enamored with the second coming of Jesus Christ. So much so that they, in error, try to predict when that coming will happen. The Bible does teach a second coming of Christ. And to deny that there will be a second coming of Christ is to deny what the Bible teaches. 
But the church today is so caught up in the timing of that coming that they miss the important message of the coming. Namely, that we're to be preparing ourselves. Holiness is what's being uh, proclaimed alongside those, those declarations of the second coming of Jesus Christ. But any, any prediction of the time of that coming is just speculation. It's nothing more. Nobody knows. Nobody can know. And Jesus himself told us that they can't know. The prophets looked into the timing of Jesus' first coming. They looked into the timing of the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. They sought to know the time. The difference is that the prophets were, were not led in their search by their own curiosity uh, in a quest for speculative knowledge. And furthermore, they had divine warrant. And they had the Spirit's declarations to them as they looked into the timing of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in addition to the care, their careful research into the person and into the timing of Christ's advent, the prophets were enabled by Christ's Spirit to understand and prophesy concerning Christ's work as well. Again, in verse 11, his suffering, which would be followed by glory. The prophet said that the life of the Messiah would be a life of suffering. And again, there are many places in the Old Testament scriptures that speak of the suffering of Christ. But Isaiah 53, I think, hands down in my mind, speaks most clearly of the sufferings and the glory of Christ that, that would follow his suffering. He would be born a human being, this Messiah. He would undergo all the misery that human beings undergo. And you and I know something about those miseries if we've lived any time at all in this, in this world. He would endure the opposition of many enemies, be betrayed by one of his own disciples, and crucified on a cross. Elucidated in the prophets, but scattered throughout the Old Testament scriptures in the law in the historical books, in the writings, which Jesus referred to as the Psalms in that passage that we considered earlier in Luke's Gospel. Suffering, but glory. You notice in verse 11 the order that Peter gives us. Suffering first, then glory. Jesus understood this order well. He bore his afflictions willingly in order to attain the glories that would follow. He often said to his disciples that it was necessary for him to suffer these things. He spoke to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus and he said it was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things. And then enter into his glory. For the joy set before him. The writer to the Hebrews wrote, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. That's the pattern. Now, the disciples didn't understand that. That order of suffering and glory. In fact, you remember when Peter, when Jesus revealed that he must go to the cross, Peter said, no, Lord, never. And Jesus said to Peter, you're Satan's mouthpiece. Get, get behind me. Suffering and glory. The apostle knows that his readers in his own day, and he knows that we have difficulty grasping this concept, that we're slow to understand this pattern and its application in our own lives. And so one of the primary themes of this letter is that since suffering and glory are the pattern for Jesus, suffering and glory are the pattern, is the pattern for Christians. It's a pattern for our Savior. And what was true of the Savior is true for us, Peter said. 
does so in chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. He says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fire ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation, suffering and glory. And mind you, he's saying this to believers in Jesus Christ who were embroiled in persecution that you and I cannot even possibly imagine. You must suffer before you enter in to Christ's glory. And as he speaks to these Christians and as he speaks to us, he tells us to keep our eyes on the, on the glory that will inevitably follow the suffering that is inevitable for Christians. He reminds you that your hope is wrapped up in the glory of Christ, which he calls his revelation at the last time or the last day. But he wants you to remember that the Christ of glory is the Christ of the cross. He suffered first. And he entered into his glory. And so must you. And so he said to his disciples, as he says to us, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. The way to glory is the way of suffering. God's plan of salvation through Christ was prophesied from ancient times. It was researched by the prophets with great care. And finally, God's plan of salvation through Christ was prophesied for your benefit. The prophets knew themselves to be servants of future generations of believers in the Messiah. God revealed that to them. Notice Peter it doesn't say here that they didn't understand what they prophesied. Although they prophesied through a veil, so to speak, the prophets didn't do so blindly. They didn't understand all that they predicted fully, but they understood, they, they understood it to a substantial degree. And they took pains to discover what they didn't. Nor does he say that the, what the prophets prophesied had no relevance to their own generation. That they had no ministry to the, to, their, to the audience of their day. That they spoke inspired riddles to those of their own generation so their hearers couldn't understand or make any sense of them. What he says is the prophets knew ultimately that they served the future generations of the church. Their believing posterity. And that, his, that their errors, their errors including you and, and me, were heirs of the fulfillment of their message. The apostles serve future generations as well. Peter reminds his readers, as he reminds us here in verse 12, that this precious and potent salvation carried out by God, decreed by him, accomplished in Christ, applied by the Holy Spirit, was also preached by the Spirit of Christ through the apostles. You have the testimony that in the New Testament scriptures, the testimony of the apostles to confirm what the prophets wrote, the church being built, Paul says, Ephesians chapter 2, on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. Long ago, Many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. And as those eyewitnesses of the son, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation to the father's right hand. As these apostles write, they are confirming what those Old Testament prophets wrote long ago. And you and I stand in a privileged position in the history of redemption. 
we stand in a place that was enviable on the part of the prophets. We, we, we are living in a place where we have a viewpoint on the fulfillment of all that was written of the Lord Jesus Christ. The least follower of Christ today is in a better position to understand the Old Testament revelation, Old Testament prophecies, the scope of God's redemptive plan than the greatest prophet who ever lived before Christ did. I'm not saying that they do understand. I'm saying they're in a position, a better position to understand. And you remember that that's what Jesus said concerning Matthew. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel concerning John the Baptist. The least among you is greater than John the Baptist, the last of uh, the Old Covenant prophets, or the one who bridged the Old Covenant and the New Covenant revelation. The last thing Peter says in our text is that the prophet's declaration of uh, the, the, the prophet's declaration and the apostles' preaching of God's plan of salvation is so wondrous, is so heavenly, is so potent, is so powerful, that the angels of heaven yearn to peer in to this marvelous plan and the carrying out of that plan through the course of redemptive history as the prophecies of Christ are fulfilled. In his coming. The word that, that Peter uses here at the end of verse 12. This is the last thing that he says. Things into which. That is things concerning the salvation of Christ. Into which angels long to look. It's a word that describes a yearning in them. It's a word that describes a straining. To see all that God has done. So precious. So potent. So powerful is God's great plan of redemption, His announcement through the prophets and the apostles by the Spirit's inspiration that the holy angels long to look over the very fortifications of the walls of heaven itself so that they can see all that God has done in Jesus Christ to behold the marvelous and wondrous spectacle of the believer's salvation. Can you picture that scene in heaven? The holy angels. Craning their necks. As it were. To behold Christ's advent. His life. His ministry. His death. His resurrection. His ascension. His exaltation. From the cradle. At Bethlehem. To the cross. At Calvary, to the glory of heaven's throne, beholding with holy reverence and wonder what God has done through his only begotten son. And there's something of a holy irony in what Peter says here. And that is that angels are spectators in this redemption. Christ did not die for the sins of any angels. Not for the sins of the fallen angels and not for the sins of the holy angels because there are no sins on the part of the holy angels. They haven't fallen. And yet they have this longing in them. Instilled by the very Spirit Himself into these majestic beings in heaven so that they long even though they're not beneficiaries as you and I are. They long to look into these things. And within this holy irony is implied another irony, an argument from the greater to the lesser. And that is that if the holy angels yearn if they crane their necks, if they seek to peer over the heavenly fortifications of the walls of, of heaven itself, how much more should you and I seek 
with yearning to come to a greater understanding, being those as we are in a better place to understand all that God has done, all that he declared through the prophets fulfilled in Jesus Christ. How much more? But is that what we do, Christians? Is that our constant yearning as those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? To do what the prophets did, to make careful inquiry into the person and the time of the advent of Jesus Christ to make careful inquiry into all of the ways that the New Testament scriptures reveal those prophecies of the Old Testament in their fullness. If you're honest with yourself, your answer will be no. And we're all the poorer for it that we do not. He wrote this epistle to show believers that God's precious and powerful plan of salvation through Christ, revealed through the, the prophets and the apostles, swallows up all of this world's tribulations. Your gracious Heavenly Father has employed prophets and apostles over the many centuries of redemptive history to serve you in a way that's designed to overwhelm with grace and glory anything that troubles you in this world. And the fact that these men of God have declared through the ages God's precious and potent plan of salvation, that they took the utmost care to be faithful to God's revealed mind and will should assure you that your Savior and His salvation is uh, that both are absolutely reliable. That's in this day of of uh, of fluctuations in in the stock market, in predictions of doom that's coming. There's one thing that you can take to the bank, and that is this precious and potent salvation accomplished for us in Jesus Christ, which is a fortification, a rock upon which we may stand as believers in Christ, which will uphold us in all of life's uncertainties, in all of its difficulties, in all of its troubles. Here it is then. Spoken and written for your sake, Peter says, pointing you to the suffering servant who's come and who's accomplished a work of grace, grandeur, and glory such that the angels in heaven are filled with holy wonder that sinful human beings should be so richly blessed by such a salvation, wrought for them through the means of God's only begotten Son. May the Spirit of God within you move your soul to ponder this precious and potent salvation so that you may be caught up and lifted above so that the knowledge of this glorious salvation would overwhelm anything that you experience in this world. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we together recognize that our care, our research, our ponderings of your holy word do not compare to the careful research and inquiry made by the prophets of old or the the apostles of the New Testament. Oh Lord, we 
confess our laziness before you, of handling your word, of seeking you in your word, of seeking to better understand all that you have written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. We pray that you would instill in us a greater desire to understand all that you've done with regard to this precious and potent salvation, which you have wrought for us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.